Shit, it don't get any better than that. Whew. What's the matter you? Welcome back to uh, Goth Dude in the Basement. It's been a while since I've been on film. And I think the reason is I've got this episode in me that I've been wanting to get out ever since I started this whole thing. But it just sort of kept pulling itself back, pulling itself back. And then I realized that if I don't give it to you now, it's not going to make sense. What the episode is, is my first lesson, the first lesson that A.J. Boner gave me. And uh, it was a remarkable lesson, a remarkable lesson. As I told you dudes, I had been talking to A.J. long distance for quite some time. I'm on the East Coast, he's on the West Coast, uh, you know, he's doing his thing teaching and uh, I think his DVD had come out by now and he was becoming famous and we keep talking and he keeps confusing me. So it got to the point where if I was going to do something with the senior tour, I had to go out and I had to see AJ, I had to see him. So we made the arrangements and uh, I think it was like uh, April maybe early May, something like that. And uh, I'd made arrangements to come out and spend three or four days with them. Nah, nah, probably three days. Two and a half days, <laughs> okay. And uh, I was going to fly out to Carlsbad, California. Now, the one thing I remember about going out to Carlsbad, California was the fact that it was like my second trip ever to California. My first trip was a pretty whirlwind, so I didn't really didn't have a feel for California, and I was really looking forward to it. And more importantly, I was, I was looking forward to it to see Jack, to see AJ, so he could explain the secret to me. So he could give me what I needed to know to make a gazillion dollars on the senior tour and move to Pauly's Island, and like I said before, live the good life. And he was my last shot. I mean, I was desperate, because I could not figure it out on my own. And I remember the stuff he had taught me years earlier, or the stuff I thought I was taught years earlier, but none of the bullshit was working. And I had been through all the books and all the DVDs, and none of that shit was working either. So I fly into Carlsbad, California. And it, this trip has been in plans like for two months, okay? And so we got all the the date set and all the time set and stuff like that. And I get into calls back California, fly directly to their airport, which, by the way, is like a really good drive from the range that AJ is teaching at. And for some reason, I get off the plane, I get my baggage, I'm standing there in like this one-horse airport. You know, it's got like a wooden bench and one telephone booth. There's no people around whatsoever, you know, and I'm wondering, well, where's this Homeland Security stuff at? And I'm walking off the plane, I'm standing out front, and there's, hey, AJ's going to pick me up. Hey, he's not there. He doesn't show up. I mean, I just flew 10,000 miles to get to his place so he could give me a lesson because my life is hinging on this thing. He doesn't show up at the airport. Well, I get on my cell phone, I call him a few times, and he calls me back, and boop, there he is, great. Oh, he said it was raining a little bit earlier on today, and I thought they had closed the airport down. I thought they were going to just uh, redirect you to San Diego or to Los Angeles, and I didn't think your flight would come in. Well, yeah, yeah, it rained, you know, like there was a drizzle or something, and he thought they were going to close the airport down. So that's how my trip started. AJ forgot to pick me up. Well, that afternoon, we had some time to kill, and I didn't realize it, but AJ, AJ has a distinct procedure, a ritual almost, as to how he helps you learn how to hit the golf ball. I'm going to try not to say the word teach because it's different than teach. It really is. How he helps you learn how to hit the golf ball. 
He's got this ritual. And he wasn't ready for it that afternoon. So what we did was we, we killed a little bit of time. Uh, and I'm glad we did because he t at the time he was a uh, consultant for TaylorMade. And he had a little cubicle in the TaylorMade corporate offices. And he took me over to, to the corporate headquarters for TaylorMade in the United States. Now, if you're thinking California, and if you're thinking sexy, and if you're thinking young, and if you're thinking vibrant, that's what the TaylorMade headquarters is all about. I mean, I have become a fan of TaylorMade products, but I'll tell you what, going into that place that day, whew, baby, that place was amazing, amazing. Remember a lot of things about it. And one of the things I remember one of, the, one of the big things I remember is walking into that joint and just seeing about 25 young engineers just running all over the place, bouncing in the walls, holding club heads, holding prototypes, just buzzing with you know, energy and activity, and they're all looking for the next great idea. And you got all these young guys Young guys and young gals are buzzing around, bzzz, trying to come up with a new idea. It's very impressive because you know one of those dudes was going to come up with a new idea. One of those guys probably already had the R7 and the R9 idea in their head, and it, it damn matriculated that day when I was in that corporate headquarters. After, after the visit to... Uh, well, actually, we saw the corporate headquarters, and we went back into the manufacturing facility, and there was just a bunch of people there just, you know, putting clubs together as well as they could and as quickly as they could. Everybody was working hard, and it just, the whole company, you could just, you know, we talk about the mission statements and the visions and all that bullshit. This whole company was focused. It was focused on doing a good job. And as soon as you walk through that door, you could feel that. I mean, I felt, I felt that before, and I felt the opposite of, of that before. So when I feel it, I know what I'm talking about. This company had a focus, and that focus was, that focus was being number one in the golf industry. And we're talking, we're talking about nine years ago. Well, after the uh, tour of the plant, and... Uh, AJ showed me some stuff on his computer in his cubicle. And what he showed me was uh, something to do about the flight of the golf ball. And that's when I first got introduced to the word tumble. You know, AJ was describing a golf ball, you know, golf balls that would go out and rise. That wasn't the way to do it. You wanted to get that golf ball going at a certain speed and a certain angle, and you want that golf ball to tumble. To tumble. Not to go up and float. Not to kill a few thousand worms, but to tumble. And he showed this to me on a computer. And when he showed it to me, I was saying to myself, Chew! Man, that's over my head. But I do remember that. And now, of course, that's state of the art, and people are trying to get their golf balls to tumble. You know, we're looking for the right launch angle. We're looking for the right launch speed. We're looking for this. We're looking for that. You know, and I go back to that day, you know, nine years ago, where AJ was describing the word tumble to me. Amazing. Well, after uh, the tour of the factory and the corporate headquarters and some of the executive offices, he took me to uh, their testing center. Now, the best way I can describe their testing center to you is in a commercial I've seen recently. And it's a great commercial by Nike. And I'm kind of surprised TaylorMade hasn't done this before. If they have, I've missed it. But, you know, Nike has this commercial out where I think Justin Leonard is hitting balls in what they call the oven. Well, man, that's great. You know, Nike in the oven, that's what it is, you know. You go out and you get this beautiful golf range out there, and you walk into this building... But the building opens up to this open air space, but yet you're, you know, you got a roof and you got walls, so you're enclosed, and they got some grass there and stuff, and you can just hit balls from this enclosed spot out into the range. Long, long, long time ago, I saw a picture of uh, Jack Nicholas and uh, his teacher, Mr. Uh, Grout. I forget his first name. 
but I think the last name was Grail. And they're practicing evidently in Ohio, and they've got these tarps up, this little tent, and it's, you know, it's the middle of the winter, and Jack's in the tent, but he's hitting balls out. Well, imagine that, make it a million times nicer, and put it in Southern California. And that's what the tailor-made testing facility is. Oh, and by the way, put a whole row of computers and simulators and club fitting and bags and pictures and really good-looking women, and put that all together. That's the tailor-made uh, testing facility. <laughs> I know, I know. Mrs. Peel's a little bit. Mrs. Peel, okay. I'm sorry. By the way, you're looking great. What are you doing? You're do whoa, whoa, back up, back up, back up. You're doing the P90X thing? Well, I'll tell you what, honey. You're looking great. I, you know, I, I would love to do that P90X thing, but it's not tr trying to do it. It's being able to do it. I mean, the exercise I see them doing on TV, I can't, do, I can't even do the exercise, more or less do it, you know, 50 times. You learn how to do it. Okay. Well, honey, it, it's working for you. Well, anyway, back to telling me. And Mrs. Peel, my uh, lovely, lovely production assistant. Getting back to telling me. We go over to their testing facility. And I guess if Nike's is called the oven, let's call TaylorMade the blast furnace because it's really cool. And AJ and I, we hunkered down and we hit a few golf balls with just we hit some wedges to a little green that's right there. And I, I'm taking these huge divots, you know. We're hitting these little 30 yard wedge shots. Yeah, boom. I'm taking these huge divots because the ground's a little bit soft, you know. I think I'm starting to get AJ a little bit ticked off on me because I'm messing up this practice range. It's so beautiful, you know. But we're there for a while and we do that thing. We go back to his driving range and uh, or the driving range he's practicing at. And uh yeah, I get the feeling he's not ready to start this thing, but he, you know, we got time on our hands, and he says, well, let me see, you know, hit a few balls. Let's hit a few balls. And I get up there with a three wood, okay? And a three wood is my favorite club. In fact, this is it. This is an old tailor made burner spoon, 13 degree. And years and years and years ago, I reshafted it with what was called a rocket shaft. And I could knock the shit out of this club. Just kill it. Well, you have to understand where I was in that point in time. You know, it was, uh, I really hadn't started my golf season yet. And I was totally confused as to what I wanted to do with the golf club and how I wanted to hit that golf ball. And I just couldn't do it. So anyway, I get up there with a the three wood and I start hacking away at it. You know, and AJ is doing his best just to be kind to me. And he starts talking about the tip, the tip of the golf club, the tip of the shaft. Now, I knew there was a shaft. I knew there was a grip. I knew there was a club head. But nobody ever talked to him about the tip, the tip of the shaft. And he was trying to talk to me about the tip as far as, well, he would say, well, well dude, what's the tip doing? You know, I'd miss another shot. I said, what's the tip doing? And I got to tell you, not only did I not know what the tip was doing, I didn't know where the tip was. So he started talking about that. And the more he talked about that, the more confused I got and the worse I hit the ball. I mean, I was lucky. I'm telling you, I was lucky to get the ball airborne with my favorite club. Couldn't get it airborne. Now, that thing about the tip, we got we to gotta stop right there. AJ has this unique way of telling me stuff like that that I dismiss. And I've told you guys about that. He'll say something like that. I'll say, that doesn't make any sense. I'm out of here. Give me a break. I'm not going to listen to that. And then the thing comes back, you know, and it does the Mr. Spock thing. Oh! And it hits me, and I realized what he was talking about. Well, here we are nine years later, 
And he really hasn't talked about the tip to me anymore because I think he knows he gives me a migraine. But I still think about it from time to time. And I really haven't grasped it. But that's all right. That's pretty cool. That's what AJ is all about. You know, he gives you the stuff, and it just sort of floats around, floats around, floats around, you know, and you, and you, try, to, you, you try to grab it. And sometimes you say, hey, I don't want to grab it. But that's okay. A tip thing's still floating out there. And Jack, I'm telling you right now, I'm still thinking about it. Thank you for giving it to me. I don't understand it. It might be the death of me, but thank you. Well, a AJ, uh, he actually was putting me up at his house with his lovely wife. And uh, I got to meet her. And she's, she's a remarkable lady. And we had dinner, I think, that night together. And uh, the next day, we start out on our adventure, our lesson. And that's why I'm giving you this episode. <laughs> Excuse me for being so slow to get into it. But... And we, 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 stop, we stop and we have breakfast. Well, we have breakfast, actually. The, the driving range that he's given lessons to is the Olympic, uh, Olympic Golf Resort, Golf and Tennis Resort. And it's this nice hotel. Uh, with beautiful swimming pools, beautiful uh, tennis courts, flowers all over the place. You know, I remember the air just smelling so sweet. Woo! I mean, if that's California, i got to move there. It just smelled great. And it has this driving range in the back of the hotel. And I was expecting to go into this five-star driving range with AJ, you know, hitting off beautiful uh, grass and stuff like that. And this place was, uh, the, the range itself was uh, kind of a dump. <laughs> I mean, you know, your expectations are so high when you're going there, you know. And then you get there and you got, you got mats that are in worse shape than this. And you're hitting out at a range that has uh, some puddles out there and some little trampoline sort of things and some big truck tires and, you know, I mean, you know, it's like that guy, you know, Midas Mufflers, you know, the guy holding up the muffler, you know, the big statue, the 50-foot tall thing. I think he was out there. But as, as, as unimpressive as that range was, I got to tell you, I, I learned to love it. I really did. Well, anyway, AJ and I, we're getting ready to start a lesson, and there I am. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm chomping at the bit. I can't wait. Come on, let me call him. Come on, let's start hitting some balls. And AJ's got this, oh, great. He's got this trash can. You know, he's in a little corner of the range, you know, and he's got a sign up. He's got a little tent up. He's got some of those director chairs out there, and he's got this trash can. I mean, huge 50-gallon 50, 50 trash can filled with golf balls. I mean, you know, I used to salivate if I had a large bucket of golf balls. Christ, I got this big, I got this trash can filled with golf balls. I'm happy. Let me hit them. Come on. I can hit everyone who's got I, I, I can do it. Well, hey, dude, dude, come on over here and sit down. Come on, come on over here and sit down. Well, I don't want to sit down. Let's start hitting golf balls. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on over here and sit down. Now, I had watched all of AJ's DVDs, so I knew his basic premise to, you know, you know, doing that thing and stuff like that. So I sort of had all that. But then he started explaining to me how the club head is supposed to hit the ball. Well, no, I got to back up. I got to back up. Don't go nowhere. Still with me? Sorry about that. I wasn't prepared. What he does is he's sitting me down, and he's sort of standing in front of me, and he pulls out a deck of cards. You know, and he shuffles the cards up. And he says, hey, dude, I want to show you something. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm here. You know, I, I, I flew 15,000 miles, you know. Sure, I'll, I'll sit here and watch you play with cards while well, there's a perfectly good unused barrel of golf balls over there. Yeah, sure, I'll sit here and I'll watch this. And he, you know, he does this thing with the cards, you know, and he, he does this card trick, you know. And 
if you watch his DVD, you know, he comes up with the four races. He comes up with the king of clubs, you know. Oh, now, if you were going to pick a card that you really wanted to be, what would that be? And I, said, I don't know. What would it be? You know, he's oh, king of clubs, you know, golf clubs. Oh, yeah, right. You know, and the answer is, oh, here you go, king of clubs. And he does this trick for me. And I'm there, and I'm, I'm really trying to be, I'm trying to be polite. Just, just trying. Just trying to be polite. He does the car trick for me, and he pulls a rabbit out of his hat. I said, ooh, bam, that's a great trick. Can we go hit, start hitting balls now? No, 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 no. <laughs> he says, that might have been a Freudian slip. He said, no, 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 no. Let me, let me show you a trick again. Okay, fine, show me a trick again. And he does the same trick, but he puts a little different wrinkle into it, you know, and he comes up with the, you know, comes up with the card. And your card must be, boom, and that's the card. Well, at the, end of, at the end of the second trick, he says, well, okay, what do you think? I, said, I, I think those golf balls are, you know, I think they're getting ready to be hit. Well, no, wait a minute. Let me show you a trick again. Well, I don't want to bore you guys with this thing, but this went on for like ever, you know. And he's showing me this trick. He's showing me this trick. And I kind of figure out, you know, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I swear to God, I can't be that dumb. So after a while, I said to myself, he wants me to figure out how he's doing this goddamn trick. Yeah, that's it. So I said, okay, fine. Now listen, I only know how to do one trick, one car trick, you know, and I only know how to tell one joke, but I got one car trick, and the car trick goes something like this. You know, I'm not a magician. I'm not trying to impress you. But, you know, just tell me when to stop. You know, which, which card do you want to see? Oh, you want to see that card? Okay, fine. There you go. I'm not looking at the card. That's your card. Put it in there. I want you guys to think about it. Think about it. Ooh, oh, queen of spades. Poof, <laughs> baby doll. What a trick. That's the only card trick I know. Now, he keeps doing his trick, keeps doing his trick, and I'm not in the tricks, you know, but he wants me to figure out that trick. So what I do is I, f I go back to the trick that I know how to do, and I try to f use that premise to figure out how he's doing that trick. And then all of a sudden, he's shuffling his cards, and he's getting ready to do his trick again. And he's shuffling his cards, and I see the card on the bottom is a ten of clubs. And, I say, and he starts doing his trick. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me take a guess. Ten of clubs. Well, that lesson was over. That lesson was over. Excuse me. So then we get down to the golf thing, and the bucket of balls, the, the barrel balls over there, and we're going to start hitting them. But the whole gist of that thing was hitting a golf ball is a trick. And I've told you guys this, and I'm serious. It is a trick. It ain't magic, though. Okay, it's a trick. It ain't magic. Very key point. Not magic, dude. Not magic. And he has just proven that point to me. So I know there's a trick there. All I got to do is learn how to do the trick. What he goes on to explain to me is, is to hit a really, really good golf shot, at impact, the face of the club is about six degrees open, and it closes around the club, and the ball basically goes straight. But he's telling me this because he wants to get the one point across is that club face at impact is open and it kind of shuts around the golf ball. Now, that's the first time anybody has ever said to me, the club face is open at impact. I've always been trying to get the club face squared impact. I never really knew what the club face or the club head was doing through impact. So he got me thinking on a different plane that I had never been to before. So I get up, 
with this newfound knowledge, and I can't hit a ball. I just can't, I just can't hit it. I don't know what he's talking about. You know, I'm hitting slices. I'm hitting weak little worm burners to the left, high slices to the right, hitting it out in the road. Just ugly stuff. And then, you know, he starts talking to me about, come on, the club face is open. You shut it down over the ball. It's not like a ping pong shot. Ooh, where's that damn ping pong again? Like a ping pong shot, like a ping pong shot. Well, after hitting maybe, I don't know, 50 golf balls, something like that, I realized that I'm not doing, I'm not doing what I have to do to make that ball go out there where I want it to go. And I'm tired of just hitting these shots all over the place. I mean, I, I've done the Hogan swing. I've done the couple swing. I've done everything. And I just can't make that golf ball go out there. Can't do it. Sorry. So my whole life basically is crashing down, you know, all around me because I can't, I can't do this thing. And he's keep, he keeps talking to me about that club head being open and going to close, but at impact, it's still a little bit open, and then it closes down. Now, I'm not going to get real technical with you here, but AJ explains it kind of like this, and I'm butchering it, but, you know, come on. With the club head being open, you add that to the fact that you're putting a little bit of hook spit on the ball, they kind of neutralize each other. Club head being open, hook spin, ball goes straight. And it was amazing. For those two days or three days or whatever the hell it was, I could pick out AJ's students on the range after that first session. And the reason I could is because when they would hit the ball, that golf ball looked like it wanted to go left, then it wanted to go right, but it couldn't make up its mind, so it just went straight. Now, I know you're out there saying, bullshit. Well, go ahead. You can say it as much as you want, but I'm telling you, that was my impression. And I could actually pick his students out because they, they would hit that ball, and it was sort of like it was looking for something. Oh, I'm going to go straight. I could pick out every one of his students. And you know, the funny thing about that is, when I go to a PGA toy, which isn't often, and those guys hit that ball, and I see that ball go kind of straight the way, I mean, you know, you watch pros hit the ball, it's not, boom, it ain't, it ain't over there, it ain't over there. It, it's, 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 you know, it's straight and it falls a different direction. You know, it, it falls to the left, that's their draw, it falls to the right, that's their fade, but it's just, it ain't, it ain't curving, it just sort of falls. And I'm watching AJ students do this, you know, I said, oh, that's an AJ student. Oh, that's an AJ student. I, I remember the second day I walked in there, and there was a guy sort of out of AJ's teaching area, you know, and he was in the middle, and, and I said to myself, I said, well, that son of a bitch is hitting the ball like AJ. And later on that day, that guy comes over here and takes lessons from AJ. I said, who, baby, I got this now. So anyway, I, I'm just still hitting balls, and I'm trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I say to myself, okay, that's right hand, right thigh. Right hand, right thigh. And I start hitting the ball, and I start hitting this damn shot out there that just goes straight as an arrow. Straight as an arrow and strong. The ball's tumbling. Tumbling, I tell you, Jerry, tumbling. And AJ looks at me and says, oh, you, you, that's pretty good. You got it. What's going on? I said, well, that's just right hand, right thigh. And he says to me, he says, what do you mean, right hand, right thigh? And I go back and, <laughs> you know, that previous year, David Ledbetter's book had come out. And somebody, a real good golfer, told me about it. He said, oh, this is the Bible. You've got to buy this book. And David Ledbetter came out with this book. It was a really expensive book. You know, I don't know how much I paid for it. Let's call it 50 bucks, something like that, you know. And in the book, he had this uh, caricature drawn up. And the characters caricature looked a lot like David Frost, who I believe was a Ledbetter uh, student, one of the first ones. And it was really a good book. It takes you through all the positions, you know. And you say, okay, you got this position, and you got that position, and you got that position. And, and when you're coming down, I can remember this character, David Frost, he's right there. And I remember seeing that position and saying to myself, okay, right hand, 
when I'm coming down, my right hand is right here on my right thigh. It's pointing out this way. By the time my right hand gets back to here, that hand's got to be pointing there. Well, of course, if that's the case, your club face is open and you're going to be hitting that home run. Well, AJ was telling me about this uh, club face being open, and the only way I could do it was thinking about right hand, right thigh. And I told him that, right hand, right thigh, and <laughs> I'll never forget. He said, hey, dude, you mind if I use that? Well, here's that whole Jim Flick gun. Jim Flick thing again, you know? This industry is so great, and you don't know when you're going to run into an idea that's really, really good or that you like and you can use. And within this industry, yeah, sure, you can use it. But AJ asked me, he said, hey, dude, do you mind if I use that right hand, right thigh? Now nah, go ahead and do it. So for the rest of the day, I had this big, big barrel full of got balls, and I just started hitting got balls. And all I wanted to do is make sure that club face was open at impact. Now you're going to say, hey, dude, I, I don't like that. Open, that means a cut, you know, I don't feel strong with it. You know, listen, take my word for it. That club head going through impact is about four to six degrees open, and it's turning over. You know, this is Masters weekend, and I'm watching the Masters on TV. And there's a scene where they describe a hole, and every hole has got a damn uh, flower's name to it or a tree's name to it, you know. And, and in, that, in that whole damn commercial, that segment or whatever, they've got this driver coming through into the ball. And that driver's hitting that ball, and boom, that driver head's going over. Well, listen, let me ask you a question. Doesn't it make sense if this driver head is, boom, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If this driver head is going like this, goosh, through the ball, that it would have to be open coming into the ball? Because if it was square and if it was turning over, what would you be doing? You'd be hitting Hogan. You'd be hitting dead left. What do you think Hogan figured out? Come on, man, put your thinking caps on. You watch this thing, you watch that thing from Augusta on CBS or whatever channel it's on. And that club head, that driver is coming through, and it's you can see that toe going over like that. Well, listen, if that toe's going over like that, doesn't it make sense that, that toe's got to be open before it does that? Think about that. Well, anyway, I start hitting balls, and all I'm trying to do is have that club head open at impact. Run away, run away. And uh, I can't miss a shot. We started out, I was doing it, and I think I did it with a sandwich. And the first time I did it, I think AJ by this time had some more uh, students there. So I was basically, you know, he had cured me. He had given me the keys to the castle, the keys to the kingdom. And he, he just left me be to, to learn for myself how to do it. Well, when I learned myself how to do it, you know, I had this sandwich in my hand, and I was just, you know, keeping that club face open and closing it through impact, like kind of like hitting the, the damn ping pong thing. I'm sorry if I'm boring you with the ping pong thing, but man, that is like the best picture I can give you. Well, anyway, I'm doing that. I'm doing that with the pitching, the pitching wedge or a wedge or something like that. And then I, I graduate myself, uh, you know, up to a short iron. So, okay, well, let's see if it works with this bitch. Okay, club face open. Whew, baby. I just keep doing that. Well, then I work my way up to, uh, I don't know what I work my way up to. Yeah, I start hitting driver. That's what I did. Driver, driver. Mrs. Peel, would you please rearrange those golf clubs? It's supposed to be in alphabetical order. Well, anyway, I get to the driver, and the driver is a test because, you know, the driver, the driver is a club. You know, the driver is the club. If you want to play golf, you got to be able to nail this bitch. So I get there with the driver, say, okay, well, what I, okay, club face open. And I remember when I hit that first driver with the club face open, I said to myself, eh, well, it didn't feel that great. And I looked up, and that ball was doing that damn dance. 
You know that dance where it wants to go left, it wants to go right, and it's going straight, and it's tumbling. Tumbling, I tell you. And I said to myself, I said, well, well shit, that's pretty good. So then I started to beat drivers. And the more I could keep that club face open through impact, the more, the harder I could hit it. And I just, I just, I was just doing that, and I did that for hours. And I fell in love. Fell in love. It was pretty close to when I met you. Well, I got bored hitting all these great shots. I mean, I was starting to draw a crowd. You know, they were charging the mission. I said, well, I got to stop this shit. So I pulled out a two iron. Lord knows I can't hit a two iron. You know, that old Leacherino thing, you know, hold up in your head and light. And well, you know, God can't hit a two iron or whatever it was, one iron. I can't hit a two iron. Well, I pulled my two iron out. I said, okay, well, what do I want to do? Well, let me just see if I can keep that club face open and do that. And I remember hitting that shot. And that shot went dead at the 200-yard marker. And again, it had that damn strange look about it. And I swear to God, you know, ain't no bullshit in the basement. The ball looks like it wants to go left. It looks like it wants to go right. It can't make up its mind, and it goes straight. And I hit about a half dozen two irons, and that was it. Well, I remember two more things after that lesson. And those two things are this. AJ and I were having dinner, and uh, I don't believe his wife was with No, his wife was not with us. We were having dinner. We were eating steak. We were sort of summing up the day's events or the lessons events. And we're talking, we're talking, we're talking. And I start asking some questions. And I think AJ gets a suspicion that I'm getting ready to go into translation. And he doesn't want that. And we're sitting across the table from each other, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, dude, dude. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. And that was it. Be careful out there. Giddy up. And uh, A.J. Boner, thank you very much. I love you, dude. Mm -hmm.